Good morning, Woman of Truth here. I'm gonna switch gears today and I'm gonna do the thing that I love. I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I'm going to speak uh, this morning on something the Lord has laid on my heart for many weeks. And to be honest, I've been so busy physically, working out in the heat, working on a cargo trailer uh, conversion, that I have taken little time because, you know what? I catch the work while the weather is permitting pretty soon. Uh, winter's going to descend upon us and bad weather, uh, possibly, and I'm not going to be able to get the things done outdoors that I need to get done. So without making any more excuses for myself, I have to admit that I have just plunged myself into uh, my outdoor prepping and what I've got to do that I feel is uh, pertinent to me today to do. So while I've been working, the Lord has spoken to my heart on the very next thing that he would like me to speak on. So I'm going to be honest with you. I have not sat down this morning with an exhaustive study, which is something that almost always precedes any time I speak on a matter, especially with a board behind me. Um, I haven't done that. We're going to go off the cuff and we're going to go from the wisdom of the Word of God and those that I have studied throughout the years. And if I can create a video that speaks clearly the message that is on my heart as woman of truth, this is what God has called me to do. If I cannot convey that in the next hour uh, here in my home, then I'll stop it. I'll go out and do my work. I'll hit the books this afternoon and then I'll return to this project. I don't know if that made much sense to you, but again, I generally hit the research and then do the video. But today we're going to do it a little bit backwards because of time. I'm going to try to go off the cuff and speak what's on my heart with the knowledge and the wisdom that's already been given to me. This morning I want to speak on the great relationship fracture. And the relationship fracture is why we are in a troubled universe. The relationship fracture between God and mankind and between mankind and mankind is all because of what took place a long time ago. Time ago. Now, I've already created a video, which is my favorite, by the way. It's called The History of Deception. If you can endure uh, a lot of the little faux pas and mistakes that are in there just because my brain and my lips are not moving in the same uh, space and the same speed, um, the content is very accurate. Uh, and it's one of my favorites. And I'll tell you how I know the Holy Spirit was in it because I very rarely review my own videos, but that one, when I need encouragement and I need grounding back to my calling and I need to get back in the race, um, you know, preparing a, a conversion of a cargo trailer into an off-grid emergency vehicle is fine. They ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but it is not my calling and my purpose. This is my calling and my purpose. But to, to get grounded back in, I can pull up that video and it will encourage me and inspire me uh, like other people that I pull up and listen to. I mean, uh, my favorite messages. Uh, Priscilla Shire, uh, she preaches this one message on uh, the power of prayer. And her, her father, Tony Evans, preaches on a, a message or two on prayer that they are my go-to messages. Um, there are just certain favorite messages. And that uh, message that I created, the history of deception, it does the same thing for me. It puts me back on track. This morning, I want to go back to the garden again. You say, you're always going back to the garden. Well, you're not going to be able to make sense of the present. You're not going to be able to navigate the future or the present until you look at the past. And if you are unwise and you look at the past and don't learn from it, then you're just an idiot. <laughs> and, and, you know, you can't be helped. I can't be helped if we can't learn from the past. So we're going to go back to the Garden of Eden, actually before the Garden of Eden. And I want to talk about what's wrong with us. What is wrong with the relationship between parents and their children? What is wrong with the relationships between men and women, husbands and wives? 
What is wrong with our relationship between ourselves and the governing bodies that, that govern our lands and our countries and our cities and our states? And I'm going to show you that there's a great relationship fracture as a result of what happened prior to the Garden of Eden. Let's quickly go back and get a review of what happened. I'll try to get this on on camera. Uh, some people said the last time I did this, they wish they could have seen the board. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't have a great setup. I don't have a uh, studio. I have an office utility room. <laughs> and so we have to make do with what we have, don't we? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Actually, before Genesis chapter 3, let's go back to prior to Genesis chapter 1. I want to show you that there was at one time order in heaven. I don't know if you can see this. At one time, there was order in heaven and all the universe. You know, before he spoke the worlds into existence, something existed. Before the great I am uh, began to speak the worlds into existence as we know it, before he spewed the galaxies out of his mouth, he was and is and ever will be. So there was order. And in his place, in his throne, and I, I say he spoke ex cathedra from a throne. I believe that's what it was. It's all about a throne. Remember, in the history of deception video, I told you that everything in the word of God points to a throne. And when the Lord who was and is and is to come, he spoke, he existed from a throne. And from that throne, there was order in heaven. <laughs> there was order. Everything that he had created up to that point, the angelic beings are creations of his. They all had one purpose, and that was to be, to be in subjection to the one on the throne. And that's the Lord. That would be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three and one, one and three. You say, well, Jesus wasn't born yet. No, but he always was. He's the great I am. It's always spoken in reference to him. He's the great I am. And he's the one that is coming back. So we have the Trinity who was not created, who always was. You say, well, I can't wrap my head around that. I'm sorry. But you can wrap your head around other things that the uh, scientific world is trying to convince you of. But you can't wrap your head around that. They ain't no help for you. You're going to have to get your help from the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that spiritual things cannot be understood by the natural man. The natural man cannot receive the things of God because they are the things of the Spirit. He can't spiritually discern them. Now, if you are a spiritual man, and you are, you ought to be able to discern all spiritual things if you will open yourself up to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to take these off because they bother me. I can, I only need them for reading. So this is, I can see this board, but if I were up close, I would have to uh, put them on. So we have order in heaven and then something disrupts that order. Well, most of you know, and, and you say, you're going to say it again. Oh yeah, I'm going to say it again. The enemy of order who is lucifer he was a cherub he was his job was to come it says the cherub that covered he covered the throne of god and it, it describes his beauty we've i've already discussed this in prior videos but his body was emerald topaz and forgive me if i'm not saying the correct stones that made up his beauty but he was, he was a, a living organ of music, and he said things in his heart. I believe they were the five things that he said, I will. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend into the heavens. I, there must have been something higher than the eternal heavens that they existed in because he said, I will ascend. So he was already in a high place. But this is the good thing. Scientifically, if you're listening, if your scientific ear is listening, even Lucifer confesses that there were galaxies beyond what he already knew existed because he said, I will ascend into the heavens. He said this before he was cast out of that particular heaven, that particular space in the atmosphere. So he was cast out of heaven because of the pride that was in him. And he challenged authority. So the great relationship fracture is all 
about authority. Now, hold on to that thought because it is the essence behind what is taking place in our world and in our government. It's people who do not have the authority to be the authority for you. It's, there, it's this struggle of control and authority. And that struggle has caused relationships to malfunction and will continue to cause relationships to malfunction function from now until Jesus Christ returns and fixes the problem. Now, there was order in heaven. That order was disrupted when Lucifer rose up against the Lord and he speaks about those things. He says, I'll ascend into the heavens, meaning he knew there was more out here. And the Lord said, ain't nothing, not going to happen. Not going to happen. I'm not only not going to let you to send, I'm going to cast you down. And he cast him out of heaven into this other atmosphere. Now, I don't know when that took place. I do not know if it took place prior to the creation that we see in Genesis chapter 1. I don't know. The scripture is not that clear. But I do know this. He was cast out with one third of all of heaven. That is is a powerful revolt. Stop and think about the numbers. There were multitudes of angelic beings that were created by God. Now, I do not know whether those angelic beings procreated among themselves. I have no clue. I do not know if those angelic beings who were on the side of, on the side of good, who were under the order and control of the one true God, whether they have the ability to procreate back then. I have no clue, but I know they were multitudes and multitudes and one third of those multitudes rebelled with Lucifer and were cast out into my space. <laughs> I, I chose that on purpose. When I say my space, they were cast out into yours and my space, even though you and I did not exist yet and possibly the creation of the earth as we know it did not exist. But we know he was given the permission to, to be the prince in the power of the airways. Okay, this is something that I've already spoken about. But we have a relationship fracture and it's all about authority and it's all about control. So man comes along. He's created by God. He is put in this earth and uh, Satan is still mad. You know, he's angry because he wants control. There, there's never been a question as to what his motive was. His motive from the very beginning was to usurp the authority of God, his father. He's called the son, son of the morning, Lucifer, the son of the morning. You know, he's called, he's the son of God in, in the scripture. He, he's making that he's he was made in the image of God. Adam was made in the image of God. We are created in the image of God. Jesus Christ is called the son of God. We were made in his image. So he rebels against his father and now he's angry because he wants the authority and the control of the entire world. He wants it. He wants the, he wanted the authority of the heaven. He wanted the authority that was above the heavens. He wanted, he, he has the authority or wanted the authority of hell. And he wanted the authority once the creation took place and mankind was put here on this earth to multiply. He wanted the authority of man. So now we have a relationship problem. So Adam, what happens? He's dwelling with Eve. He was created from the dust of the earth. God said, I have nobody to plant this beautiful utopia that I've given to mankind. I've put a tree in the midst of the garden. I said, any, he said, anything that you want, you can have. But this tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you cannot eat of it because in the day that you eat it, you shall die. Eve gets seduced by a Lucifer, the fallen one. And she yields, and because she's deceived, um, her relationship with Adam is completely fractured. Her relationship with God is completely fractured. So again, the fall of Lucifer is all about breaking away from the authority of the one who sits on the throne. And so in that moment, her relationship with God the Father is broken. 
All mankind is broken. Adam looks at it. It says she gave the fruit to Adam who was with her. <laughs> I always stress that. And one of these days, I'm going to teach just on that. He gives, she gives it to him who is with her. And again, I'm going to reiterate all those people who are preaching and teaching that Adam did it out of love. Stop it with your, stop it. Just stop it. I'm not, I can't tolerate it. Don't think that it's wrong. That is wrong. He did it because he willfully sinned against God. He chose her. He chose sin. He chose these things, not out of love, but because Adam was not deceived, but Eve being deceived was in the transgression but he looked at something and he saw it and he disbelieved God. Doubt crept in. He thought God had withheld some good thing from him. He no longer believed God was the authority. He challenged God's authority and he took it never dreaming that, you know, he, he didn't believe he was going to die. He didn't know what it was. He took it and he died. The relationship fracture just continued. And now the head of all things, Adam, the head of all things, his relationship with God is fractured. So every relationship after that, every husband and wife relationship from that point on is going to have an issue with a fractured relationship. The harmony will only be there if they will both surrender to God. So see, what's going on in the, in the world right now is... There are a few who want the authority that only God holds. And they want you to do, they know, they know that the key to harmony is submission. Okay. But it's the wrong kind of submission. You see the key to harmony within our souls, the key to the harmony within a good godly marriage is when two fallen individuals in a fallen earth, such as Adam and Eve, surrender to one another because they are surrendering to God. So, Fauci, uh, Congress, they know the key to harmony <laughs> in the distorted, twisted, wicked, satanic, Luciferian uh, knowledge is the key to the harmony that they want is that they take the authority that only God has and bully you into submission. Because when you are submitted to them, the friction is gone. Then they can do as they please. You see how Satan takes a biblical concept, a biblical truth, and twists it. But the problem is the only submission and the only freedom that we have in fixing broken relationships is not when we submit to a government or first submit to an individual. It's first in submitting to God. Now, here's the, here's the, the catch. When we submit to God, then we are able through him to submit to one another and have harmony. But if we have it all cockeyed and backwards, you know, I believe there are a lot of whoremongers out there, women, men, young people, older people who are just, they're whoremongers. They go, you know what they are? They're hooked on, they're, they're love whores. They aren't looking necessarily to fulfill their sexual desires a lot of the time, or they didn't start out that way. They were looking for intimacy. They were looking for love. The love whores, that's what I call them. And they end up looking for the, the good thing in the wrong places. And then they become entrenched in this lifestyle where they're not getting the intimacy because they're broken. They are broken. They're suffering from broken intimacy with God the Father. Adam and Eve suffered in broken intimacy. What were they doing at the end of the day before the fall? They were walking in the coolness of the evening and they were walking with the Lord and co communicating with him. 
You know, I love that old hymn. It's the first hymn I sang in church when I was tiny. I remember somebody recalling it. They said I was so tiny that I somebody had me standing behind the pulpit and all they could see was my little eyes over the, over the pulpit. And I was singing. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear ah, within my heart discloses. And it's talking about just communicating in relationship with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. And that, my friends, was broken. And now we have a government, a world that would like to correct the relationship fracture by taking control, usurping the authority of God himself, stepping in and making you causing you, forcing you through their various ways to submit to their authority because it's all about authority. Remember what happened. They sinned and then the Lord comes down and he has a talk with them all and he sets, he sets the course for the next few thousand, uh, few thousands of years. And he says to Adam, he says, Adam, you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. He said, Eve, you're going to, in sorrow, I will greatly multiply thy conception, meaning she's going to have a lot of youngins, <laughs> and it's going to hurt, and it's going to mess with her, her uh, <clears throat> emotions. It's going to mess with her hormones. She's got this imbalance going on, you know, and before they were strictly vegetarians, but after what they did, he had to show them how to survive. They went from being a vegetarian and having this pure stuff running through their veins that may not have been, it, it absolutely was not the same blood that's running through our veins now. It was pure. It was probably a different color. It was probably just so pure and they go from being eating herbs and, and fruit and vegetables to eating blood meats because he kills the beast that they raised and cuddled and loved. I just buried my cat last week. I grieved for days. I absolutely grieved for days. I was and still am broken. Can you imagine after their sin because he's showing a picture of things to come because man, Satan, and man has screwed up relationship with God. There's a great fracture and there's a great struggle for control because man wants control. Woman wants control. But can you imagine him slaying that little baby, that little baby uh, uh, calf? And he, he says, now this is how you do it. And he slays it and he skins it. And they're standing there in horror being taught to do this because now Adam is going to have the preeminence over this garden and, and Eve will have to submit to the head, to Adam. We have this relationship fracture and this issue of authority and control. And it's, it's a struggle from, from then till now and will be a struggle until Jesus Christ comes back on that white char charger and he puts all hell in its place. Now, the fall of Satan, the fall of man. And so what does Satan do? What is his, what is his ministry? He's got a ministry. You know, the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. It says, the, the book starts out, and, and I love this. The, the book of Job is one of my favorite philosophical studies of, of humankind uh, in the Bible, and I, the one, there are a couple sad things about losing all of my manuscripts from Facebook because I would write these things and I'd post it on Facebook. That's why I was never real favored because though a lot of people like to read my stuff, those close to home in my own church were starting to shun me because if you get on fire for Jesus Christ, and I mean, I mean, you sell out to Jesus Christ and you start walking and talking and speaking those things that are spiritual. Even those in your church will start unfriending you and not liking you because you disrupt their comfort. See, we like our comfort zone. You disrupt them. But the, the book of Job, I had started writing on the book of Job 
and you know, I was going chapter by chapter, which is my favorite way to study and my favorite way to, to do things. And I've lost all that. When I left Facebook, I left it all. So what is Satan's ministry? Okay. Now, in my video, The History of Deception, that some of you kindly listen to, I mentioned the deception that Satan put in this earth and calls mankind, but but I want to tell you something. Mankind has now inherited that deceptive nature from the, the first Adam. Um, so we now have that deceptive nature. The Bible says that as soon as a man is, is born, he goeth forth speaking lies. How do I know this? I've had seven children. I tell you what, that Abigail, she was my number three little girl. She came into this world a yelling and a screaming. I will never forget after I gave birth to her, I was in my room and she was down the hall and I heard her lusty, strong, deep throat cry. And I said, oh my gosh, that's my daughter, isn't it? I knew her voice. I don't know how I knew her voice, but that child did not have a thing wrong with her. Not a thing. And boy, she's been grumpy since that day. <laughs> she was just, I was embarrassed. That's my kid making all that racket. What's wrong with her? And they said, there's nothing wrong with her. <laughs> That's just who she was. So she comes into the world speaking lies like she's dying. Uh, another illustration of, of my children, Bethany. Um, Bethany um, is my young, uh, second to the youngest daughter. Everything about her birth was just so easy. <laughs> I mean, I had to convince, nobody believed me when I said I was in labor. I said, come on folks, we gotta get to the hospital. And they're just sleeping and that can't get them up. And I said, guys, it's for real. Her labor with her was so easy compared to everything else. I finally pulled my ex-husband out of the bed and I said, you have to get me to the closest hospital. I'm going to give birth. And they're just dragging their feet. Nobody's that, you know, I mean, I've done this so, so many times before. Um, and it's like, it took forever once they got there. And it's like, they didn't, you know, they were just dragging their feet. We pull into the parking lot. I never dreamed I'd be given a birthing story here. <laughs> like women get together and do. I never do this, but I'm doing it today because I want to, I have an illustration. So we pull into the parking lot and it's the first time my water has ever broke. I've had seven kids and my water has never broken. But boy, it did that time. I said, I'm getting ready to have a baby. And I wasn't even in the hospital yet. So at that point, they take me serious. I'm in the hospital for 25 minutes and I give birth and this sweet little beautiful child uh, comes into the world and her little cry is like real, real gentle and real polite. In, in strict or in drastic comparison to Abigail's cry, Bethany was just so sweet. And so, and so a couple of days passed and the doctor who delivered her, he, he had to, you know, check me out of the hospital. He says, come here, I want to show you something. And I went over to the, to the baby. She's all bundled up. She had salt and pepper hair. I mean, the kid had black and white hair. It was the most beautiful thing. It looked like she had gotten a frost job. She had a head full of frosted hair. It was just, this thing was beautiful and sweet. And um, he, uh, he says, I got to show you something. And he said, uh, he said, watch this. She was whimpering and he put his hand on her and she stopped. He pulled his hand away. She started whimpering. He put his hand back and she stopped. He said, you got yourself a pick me up, baby. <laughs> and I said, that is so true. She's lying. Not a thing wrong with her. She wanted to be picked up. And so we are born into this world with this sinful, deceptive nature. But praise God, he sent a way out of our dilemma. He sent I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. From whence do I get my call name, woman of truth? Do you think it's because I think I have something no one else has? No, it's a reminder to me that every time I open up my mouth, I better speak as the oracles of heaven. And I speak the truth <laughs> because I represent the way, the truth, and the life. 
and no man's going to come to the Father but by him. So we have a problem with authority in the garden. He says, Adam, you know, you're going to be over this thing, but you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. Satan, uh, you're going to go on your belly, you shall go. And he says, uh, you know, you're going to bruise the, you know, there's this enmity between him and Eve. And Eve, he's, he says, your desire is to be to your husband. Now, let's talk about that a moment. Some of you women and men have come into this world with extremely functional representatives of God the Father. You had a father and a mother that demonstrated authority in a manner in which it was a good thing. You know, you, you followed the commandment, the first commandment with promise. Children, obey the, thy parents and uh, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long on the earth. So you came into this very functional representation of God the Father when it comes to authority. Your father wasn't evil. Uh, your father and your mother had wisdom. They, they, they trained you. They taught you. And though flawed they are because they were human, they did an excellent job representing authority, godly authority. And then some of you, you grew up with fathers or mothers or one or the other or neither. And you had no representation of good godly authority. Matter of fact, the authority in your life were the ones that persecuted you. They abused you. They molested you. They neglected you. And therefore, you have a difficult time understanding godly authority. So we have Adam and Eve. And as far as we know, uh, this was all new to them. Eve being in subjection to Adam and Adam knowing how to rule over Eve without being cruel and loving her as Christ loves the church. So we have a broken world. Now, did he love her as he should? Was she able to submit to authority? Possibly and, and likely. They were new at this, but I think they were God-fearing. They certainly understood the consequences of disobedience. So we have an issue in our world which has caused problems with, you know, how do we respect authority? So we have this, this government authority that is, according to the book of Romans, it is by God. It's ordained by God. It is ordained by God that we should have governments with authority and power. Kings and queens and, and uh, authority is not a bad thing in the earth. But when authority usurps the authority of God the Father, and especially in America where we discovered over 200 years ago, 400 years ago, however many years ago, that this nation was unique in that it had the proper balance because it understood God. It our nation is an example of children who grew up with functional parents. Our nation's history, our forefathers, James Madison Jr., my second cousin, seven times removed, is an example of somebody who grew up understanding good godly authority. Therefore, he was qualified to write and author a constitution that displayed to the earth that yes, we will submit to this authority. Yes, we can have a governing authority, but these are the guidelines. The guidelines are that that authority cannot usurp from mankind their God-given freedoms from God himself. It's getting hot in here. See? So when you stray from that type of good, godly, governing authority and you mess the whole thing up, then you have one broken, fractured relationship. Relationship after relationship is fractured and broken. And our relationship with our government is fractured and broken because the, the government that we have lying 
to its citizens, stealing from its citizens, abusing its citizens. It's like a husband who says, honey, you're going to obey me because I'm your head and God said I'm your head and, and you better let and smack her around a little bit and do this. You better perform this way. And it's okay if I go out and hormone while you're here on Saturday night and I'm out running around, you better submit to me because I'm your husband and I'm your head. And that's what we have. We have a government who is rogue, doing their own thing, violating the laws of God, and then saying, you better submit to us or else. We have a great relationship fracture. So the Patriot comes along and the Patriot understands these things. They understand the authority of God. They have no issue whatsoever with the authority of a government that is abiding by the word of God. Abiding by, and I, I do not mean this disrespectfully, I do not compare the Constitution written by one of my forefathers that I am related to. They don't have an issue, a patriot, submitting to a government that's going to abide by the rules. But they have an issue with a government that has gone rogue and is abusive, like that rotten husband or wife who is uh, assaulting their mate and doing their own thing and then saying, you better obey me or else. No wonder people took that out of the marriage vows. <laughs> no wonder they no longer like to say, no wonder women's libs stepped up and, and did their thing. And I'm not a women's liber. I, is that term even relevant anymore? You know, no wonder you can't blame them. And thank God for a lot of them. I mean, I wouldn't be able to vote if it wasn't for women who said, wait a minute, something's a little off kilter here. <laughs> I believe that the scripture teaches that we're equal. Okay, thank God for them. Could I agree with all of them? No, heck no. There's nothing wrong with authority and trusting authority and submitting to authority. But this struggle to submit to authority that has gone rogue, you know what you do? I believe you just put on the full armor of God. It is better to obey God than man. If you can no longer obey man in their role, then you better obey God, which is why I had an issue with a year ago when my churches, our churches all had their masks on and you were sitting 10 feet away from everybody and you weren't going to the altar and praying anymore and you weren't hugging anymore and you weren't, I had an issue with falling in line with dictated rules and laws that were given by an illegitimate, illegitimate authority because it's all about authority. Now, as a little girl, my mother taught me on her lap. She told me about the cross of Christ. She told me about Jesus. I owe my spiritual rebirth to a mother's lap and the sweet little song she sang in my ear. The old rugged cross, amazing grace, he hideth my soul. She taught me the story of mankind and God. She taught me that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was my mother that taught me the story of salvation. But it wasn't until I was 13 that I understood authority. And I, I because I did not always have representatives in my life that were good godly authorities. Matter of fact, and we're not gonna go there today. And until the Lord tells me and gives me a green light to create a message that speaks of that, we're going to avoid that subject. I did not always have a good godly representative. But it wasn't until I was 13 years old that I understood godly, godly authority. And that's when I heard a message being preached. If God is not Lord of all, he isn't Lord at all. It was Bob Hamlin. He preached it. And I'll never forget it. I went up to that altar broken. I already knew Jesus Christ. I understood and believed in my heart. But there was this, this decision I had to make. Was I going to follow my own way? There was a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Or was I going to follow 
the authority of a God the Father who, when fathers and mothers forsake us, he will take us up. He who is righteous, who is holy, who is just, he alone who holds the power to shield us from the enemy. I started to say a few moments ago, what was Satan's ministry and what is it now? And I started to speak on the book of Job. Back in the book of Job, it opens up and it says, uh, the Lord, it says that Satan went before the throne. So he had freedom. After he was cast out of heaven, he was on, uh, what would you call it? He had an ankle bracelet, an ankle monitor on. <laughs> oh yeah, he was paroled. And he had to go back and give an account to his parole officer. And when he goes before the throne, he says, where have you been, Satan? He says, I've been walking about to and fro in the earth. He says, why? And he says to him, God. God, because he wants you and I to be in submission to no one else, nothing else but him first. No, D does he say to submit to authority? Yes, but if that authority is rogue and is going against God, he then says it's obey better to obey God than to obey man. And he says to Satan, where you've been? He says, I've been going to and fro on the earth. And the Lord opens up the Pandora's box. He says, hmm. Because he knew, he knew what he was about to do. He was about to raise up a man through persecution and fire. Okay. Job was trained through fire. And he says, hast thou considered my servant Job? <laughs> I said that to a philosopher in college. We were talking about Job. And I don't even know if he knew the Lord. But I said, I raised my hand. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, God... It's true. God doesn't provoke man with evil. He doesn't. But it's God who brought Satan's attention to Job. He says, hast thou considered my servant Job? How perfect he is. Why did God do that? <laughs> Was it a cruel little game? I mean, there were some times even Job, you know, he gets that pessimistic attitude when he's sitting on the ground, scraping the sores. And, you know, it, 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 he understands God's place uh, in all of this. And, and he, he, Satan goes out and you know what happens? He destructs Job's life. And the Lord says, okay, gives him permission to do this, permission to do that. He says, just, you can't take his soul. We can't take his life. And of course, Job, he would have rather died. Matter of fact, his wife said, curse God and die. And he said, no, he endured it. He said, when I am tried, he says, I shall come forth as gold. Okay. We may be in a place where Satan, while he does his ministry, his ministry of evil, and that's when God allows us to be uh, to be seen before the enemy and known before the enemy because he's doing something in us. Sometimes God is far more concerned about what's going on inside than what's going on around. But when I'm tried, I shall come forth as gold. And in the end, Job was spared. Job was restored and God gave back more than he had taken. So, in essence, he represents a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament and a type of the New Testament Christian, much like David was a type of in the Old Testament. So we have a problem with relationship and authority, okay? It's all about authority. Who is the authority? If Congress says one thing and God the Father says another, and he then who do you believe? Okay. If God says that, you know, and this is what James Madison Jr. and his buddies and all those wonderful, brilliant minds got together. They knew they had been raised by functional parents and they'd been raised by, by functional teachers for the most part. I'm not saying they didn't have corrupt parents and corrupt. I'm saying corruption was not the level where it is now. And they had good representatives for, and you know, even the Bible says in Hebrews, he's talking about the people in the hall of faith. And it says, people of whom the world is not worthy. And he mentions their names. And you know what's really neat? 
switching gears here about Hebrews chapter 11. When God sees us, he thinks so favorably of us that he puts Abraham and Sarah in that hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. At the end of the chapter, he says there's so many more, more than books could write down. And he said, people of whom the world was not worthy, but he doesn't even mention Sarah and Abraham's sin. He doesn't mention Hagar. He doesn't mention that Sarah laughed within herself when the angel of the Lord, when the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit came and spoke to Abraham and Sarah, and she laughed within herself. And the, the angel said to Abraham, why is she laughing? Or why are you laughing? She said, I haven't laughed. He said, yes, you did laugh. He doesn't even mention it because she it doesn't talk about her repentance, but clearly she repented. And she is a woman of faith because she believed God. Now, we mess up on this journey. And like Sarah and Abraham, we make some bad choices. And sometimes our faith falters and we laugh within ourselves. I've done it. I've done it. I have. It is a wonder he has not struck me dead in my lack of faith. But he still, you know, we keep coming back to him and we repent. And it's all about authority now. The media has taken the authority that did not belong to them and they've shut you out. They've shut out the voice of the world who speaks sense and speaks truth amid, amidst the lies. It's all about authority. It's all about that fractured relationship and the only way we're going to survive this authority struggle is when we do what I did at the age of 13. It's when that altar call was given and I raced to the altar and I bowed on my face before God and I said, I will submit to you. It, this wasn't even a conversion. It, 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 it was a conversion. This, this isn't even, I, I knew Jesus Christ and I trusted him as my savior at the age of seven, but at the age of 13, I said, I will submit to your authority. And because I did that, now when rogue authorities, whether it be a husband who is abusive, whether it be a government who is abusive, whether it be a pastor or a pastor-husband combination who is abusive, you say, well, you just buck authority. You're a rebel. You know, you better watch. Judge not that you be not judged. What I'm speaking about is a balance of submission to authority when that authority has not gone rogue away from the authority of God. Because though I am commanded to submit to authority, I am also to obey God rather than man. So this ends my video on the struggle for authority, the struggle for control. The media wants control. See, they know if they have control, they have you. It's all about control. This vaccine thing, it's all about control. It's, it's about control. It's not about health. It's about control. It's about control and it's about authority. Now, the beautiful thing is our Lord, who is the authority, the way, the truth, and the life, the keys of death and hell were handed to him. After he surrendered himself to death, you know, he wasn't murdered. He laid down as the Lamb of God. He laid down his life. He went into the depths of the earth, into hell. He set the prisoners free. He returned with the keys to death and hell. And when he came back, he says, that authority I'm going to give to you. He said that to the disciples. So here's the beautiful thing, folks. In the midst of this crooked and perverse world and generation, in the midst of the media lies, we can be a woman of truth. We can be a man of truth, a child of truth, a voice of truth. And we can submit to authority until it goes rogue against the authority of God. And we will obey God rather than man. But the beauty of it all is we can have authority ourselves in this earth. We can have authority in prayer if we will surrender to God, if we will, like at the age of 13, as I just bowed there broken in spirit, 
And I remember Pastor Fowler coming coming behind me as I knelt on the floor, just broken and, and crying because I'm I'm at that place. I'm at the slaughtering place. I'm I'm learning for the first time to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto Christ. And at that moment, he put his hand on my back and it was a Baptist church. It wasn't a charismatic church. So there was nothing charismatic about what he said. He put his hand on my back and he said, now, Bobby, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. And that's the first time I ever asked the Holy Spirit to fill me. And nothing happened that day. I didn't speak in tongues, didn't do anything. But joy replaced the brokenness and the sadness. And I walked up and I got up. I left my death clothes there. Those were the death clothes that even though I knew and believed in Jesus Christ, I had never come to the place where I surrendered to his authority. And I left my death clothes there. And I've put them on a few times since then. And they, they stink. They're corrupt. They're dead. They're gone. But as long as I leave my death clothes at the altar and I reckon myself as watchman knee, he said this over and over in this book, The Normal Christian Life, that he wrote, Reckon therefore yourselves dead indeed unto sin and alive unto Christ, then we can have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ because we have overcome. And at some point in this mess, we are going to be able to speak things into existence. We are going to be able to pray like Elijah. We will see the manifestation of miracles. Mike Adams said this the other day, and I just loved it. I'm just, I'm clapping as I'm listening. He said, we ought to live expecting miracles. But the only way we can do that, the only way we can do that is, is, is if we are in surrender. Surrender to the authority of God. And only then and, and, and then can he pass to us the authority, that resurrection authority that Jesus Christ promised we could have in this wicked generation that is vying for our control. You know why they hate you as a patriot? Because you won't yield. <laughs> you ain't budging. You're not moving. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. Have a wonderful day. God bless you and God bless America.